Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining the February meeting of the Los Alamos Mountaineers. So I'm going to present um, the trip report for tonight. So we finally received a fair amount of precipitation this past month. So the pictures I received and the trips I'm going to show reflect that um, in, in, in large part. So we had three club sponsored activities this past month. Um, on January 30th, I led a small group of four people to the top of Cerro Grande. Um, we, we snowshoed up there. We had fresh snow due to a storm the previous night. But that morning, the um, winds were had, you know, calmed down and the sun was out and it, that made for a very pleasant uh, climb to the top. And as always, we had those uh, gorgeous views from the Cerro Grande. This weekend, uh, Jean Dewart uh, led not uh, one, but two uh, outings uh, near Grouse Creek um, Trail. So the goal on both of those days was to find a route uh, to for uh, a loop uh, that for a future trip in the in in the area. So on both days, the day started with about three miles on Grouse Creek Trail, and then um, the groups uh, left the trail and uh, cross country skied through the woods to explore a potential route. Um, around um, the, the peak. So the group had five people on Saturday and on Sunday, um, 10 people. And I was one of them and it was an awesome day. So thank you, Jean, for adding a day to what you had originally planned uh, to enable more, uh, more participants. And uh, Jean told me that she's planning um, more, um, more trips, so stay tuned. So now I'm going to show pictures of trips, uh, individual trips um, that people have sent me. Um, so Tim Whalen, um, he's a relocated club member. Uh, he lives in Colorado. And he, uh, from Colorado Springs, he skinned up the far side of Pikes Peak uh, for about two hours and the pictures he sent off from his turnaround point and it shows a, a feature called the crags there. Olivia and four other snowshoers spent two nights at the Spruce Hole Yurt. Um, they, they snowshoed the hills nearby, uh, including during uh, a storm, a snowstorm on the second day. And Olivia said that they really enjoyed the amenities of the yurt, uh, including solar powered phone chargers. Larry and Laura Cox uh, hiked near Tsenkawi, so in Tsenkawi and also north of Tsenkawi to the Duchess Castle. Uh, site, and they sent um, a picture of that uh, interesting petroglyph of a conquistador. Jean, Annette, uh, Mary, and Sylvie went on a tour uh, near Congress Pass and on a very, very windy day, but that makes for a gorgeous picture. I uh, went to the Ojito Wilderness for the first time a couple of weeks ago, did a nine mile loop there and discovered the, the amazing geology uh, as well as a number of cabin ruins. I, I highly recommend it. It's about two hours from Los Alamos. Melanie and David had a busy month um, skiing and hiking uh, locally. Uh, Mary Thompson sent us this gorgeous picture of uh, Conridge uh, near Bluff, Utah. And then a group that calls itself the Wednesday Irregulars, uh, they hiked to Las Dos Castles south of Tsenkawi, and they were led by Barbara and um, discovered like petroglyphs and ruins and 
as usual, those great views of the mesas with the mountains in the background. Our upcoming trips include at this point uh, the Lama Trek in April um, in Utah, but that trip is full at this point. Uh, the river uh, trip in Montana in July is also full at this point. And there's um, a Moab uh, exploring trip scheduled in November, and that one still has a few spots available. And the leader is uh, uh, Bill Pridorsky, if you'd like to contact him, if you're interested in participating. If you're interested in leading a trip, as always, uh, we have resources on the website and uh, we can also help you organize or uh, back you up with uh, an experienced leader. Um, just contact me if you have any, any interest and uh, just keep, keep going out and uh, hopefully we'll get more, more snow, a few more snowstorms and we'll be able to enjoy the snow for a few more weeks. Thank you all and I'll pass it on to Beth. Okay, I uh, am Rod McCready. I set up the, <clears throat> the programs. Um, if you have an idea for a program, uh, I'd love to hear about that. I am looking for some for April and beyond. Um, our speaker tonight's Dylan Boyle. He grew up in Michigan and started adventuring pretty early as a kid through Boy Scouts and his parents took him camping, uh, started biking like most kids do, you know, around five years old, I think he said, and started going off road pretty young when he was maybe eight or so. Um, he moved to Los Alamos four years ago and I met him just a couple years ago and was impressed by his enthusiasm for uh, climbing and biking and he gave me a little tour of his dirt bagging vehicle which uh, I enjoyed. He's been bikepacking for about five years. His first trip was in Oregon with rudimentary equipment, he said, but then rapidly, uh, you know, got really interested in it and got better equipment. <clears throat> he did want me to mention that he'll be leading a couple uh, introductory trips under the auspices of the Tough Riders Mountain Bike Club. So you may want to uh, watch for that on their Facebook page. So let's welcome Dylan Boyle. Thanks, Rod, for the introduction there. Well, thanks for uh, everybody coming out. Uh, I think I saw about 140 people on the uh, participant list there. So I'm flattered so many people would show up. I want to thank the Los Alamos Mountaineers and uh, Peak for hosting me tonight to share this bike packing route that I've um, developed. Was that Took a lot of work and, and I didn't make this route just so I could go ride it, but I was you know hoping to add it as a resource for the bikepacking community so other people can use what I've developed and, and go off and have an adventure for themselves. So the uh, the route we're gonna be talking about tonight is La Polizza Grande. It means the big beating in Spanish. It's the on in the on the route, one of the last big climbs goes up Polizza Canyon, and we'll see that. And so that's kind of the namesake for the route. So it's a new bike packing route for northern New Mexico. It goes through uh, Santa Fe and Carson National Forest. It passes through the uh, Valles Caldera National Preserve several times. Um, it also passes through the uh, Jemez Pueblo and Hickory Apache Na Na Nation Reservation. It is uh, it's 293 miles and about 27,000 total feet elevation gain. Uh, it's about 75% on, on dirt roads, so that'd be like mostly forest service roads and 20% on pavement. And, you know, just to, um, you know, throw in a little bit of technical single track, there's about 15 minutes of moderate single track to uh, see how well you can ride a loaded bike on a rough terrain. But uh, so in, in developing this route, uh, I made a map here that that um, is also available with the uh, route GPX. That's um, at the end, I have a, I have a link to uh, ride with GPS where I, I have the GPX that's downloadable. There's a couple pictures and this map is here. And it's kind of a big scale map, but I, I found it really helpful when I was planning my trip to, uh, you know, look at some potential campgrounds and look at my, you know, mileage I'd be covering and to kind of, you know, use this map to, to plan my trip and then 
at the end of the day, look, you know, pull up the map and see what, what's coming for the next day. Um, so this is a little zoomed out here. What we're gonna do is uh, zoom in a little bit uh, further here so we can look at some of the detail of the map and uh, scroll down to the bottom where we see Los Alamos in the lower right hand corner with the uh, kind of the green star here. The idea is that uh, this route would start and finish in uh, Los Alamos. Uh, Los Alamos has uh, several hotels, there's a great bike shop, um, there's several restaurants and it's a really good starting point for uh, for a lot, you know, an adventure of this kind of magnitude, great uh, stores to stock up on food, et cetera. Um, and there's also a, a good public transport. So you could even fly into Albuquerque or Santa Fe, grab a bus to Los Alamos and start. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of go through the map real quick here and point out some of the highlights of the places that, um, that, the, the, route, that, that the route passes through. Um, you'll see in the, it, it starts in Los Alamos and it climbs up to a Pajarito ski area. Um, I highly recommend if you have the means to get a uh, buddy to drive you to Pajarito Ski Area because that's going to save you about 1500 feet of elevation climb. But for those traveling from out of town and really want to get the full beating package, uh, you can start in Los Alamos and, uh, and bike up to Pajarito. Um, from Pajarito, it follows uh, the Cañada Bonita Trail and then crosses the uh, Valles Caldera. Uh, just a note on the map here, it says no, there's no overnight camping allowed in the Valles Caldera, but you know, for most of the route, there's plenty of camping areas. Um, you enter the caldera from the, one of the eastern entrances and go down uh, through the caldera, passing through the north entrance, um, where we get to Chihuahuenos Creek. Um, that, takes you, uh, that takes you all the way to uh, Abiquiu. And uh, after an Abiquiu, you can, you can grab some food there before doing a long climb up to uh, Canhilan Mountain. After, the, after you ascend uh, Canhilan Mountain, you, you will go west uh, to uh, El Vado Reservoir. And from there, you'll head south, back down to uh, the French Mesa, passing through Gaina, going further south, passing through Rumadero uh, uh, Campground. This is where the, um, where the, the wilderness area is. This, this just, uh, this passes uh, just to the east of the San, San Pedro uh, wilderness there on the Forest Service roads. Uh, you can continue heading south, you'll get to some hot springs by San Antonio Creek. Following if, uh, further south, you get to La Cueva. Every, um, a lot of people know Amanda's com uh, Country Store where people can uh, you know, grab some food or get resupply location there. Um, after passing through there, the, uh, you head south to the Jimenez Pueblo. And then you, and then from the Hemos Pueblo, you return to Los uh, to Los Alamos uh, through uh, uh, Palitza Canyon here. You ascend uh, La Palitza Canyon, you reach the uh, southern portion of uh, Southern Crest uh, Caldera Rim of uh, Valdez Caldera. You cross that and then uh, arrive back in Los Alamos. So that's just some, some details about the map. Um, I do, the, the shading on the map does indicate where you are allowed to camp and not allowed to camp. Um, anywhere that's green, that's national forest, you're allowed to camp there. Uh, but some of the uh, you know, private areas that are shown in white, private land and tan areas, uh, that's Native American land. And as I mentioned before, the Valles Caldera, those are areas where uh, you know, wild camping isn't allowed. But looking at the uh, map here, there's, there's a lot of green on there. Most of the time you're in a national forest. Um, and so you can, you can pretty much camp anywhere you want to. Um, so why did I make this route? Um, the, what I'm showing here is, is another bike packing route that, uh, that, that uh, stems out of Santa Fe. You can see Santa Fe in the lower right hand corner of the map here. Um, this is the Caldera Explorer um, that, that starts uh, near Santa Fe and then climbs up and crosses the Caldera and, and uh, also passes through the San Antonio Hot Springs and ends up in Los Alamos. In the upper right hand corner, we have the Chama Charmer that starts near the, the Colorado border and uh, heads south. Um, in gray here is, the, is just a small portion of the Great Divide mountain biking route, but that passes, uh, that passes uh, through the middle of the map there. In the lower right hand corner, there's a, there's a, what is it, a Caja, de, Caja del Rio overnighter. Uh, so that's kind of a small little bike packing route out of uh, Santa Fe. For, for overnight trips. And I, I was looking at a map comparing all these routes and I said, wow, there's a lot of national forests here. 
and you know I I'd like to you know connect and, and try to you know try to expand the bike packing uh, sphere into some of the more remote corners of northern New Mexico. And so this is the route that I developed and we're going to be talking about it tonight. Um, so here's the map here and there's an elevation profile of the route that sees that uh, shows that it, you know it, it's 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 quite high in elevation. Most of the route is about 7,000 and higher. On the map, I'm just going to uh, highlight some of the towns that we'll be passing through. Uh, Los Alamos, uh, Abiquiu, Saboya, Gaina, La Cueva, and the Jemez Pueblo. Um, in terms, you can ride this road either way. Um, there's a couple sections that I do for that, that I do recommend riding this route uh, counterclockwise. Uh, Canhilan Mountain is this uh, steep climb here. And while it is uh, a bear of a climb on one side, it's really steep descent on the other side. So going the other way could be could be quite a, uh, quite a challenge. So I recommend going counterclockwise. Uh, I did it in six days. I'd say five to eight full days of riding for the uh, for the average rider, um, experienced bike packer. Um, so yeah, anywhere from 35 to 60 miles, or about 34 to 5400 elevation per day. Um, is what I, you know, is what I was was looking at, and I recommend about a four four liter of, of water capacity and the ability to treat water sources when we're out there. Just going to uh, go through some of uh, the uh, the elevation profile here and point out some of the uh, the places we'll pass through we can identify. So all, Los Alamos is at the beginning and at the end. You see the elevation is about thirty seven or seventy three hundred feet. Um, after leaving Los Alamos, you get to Pajarito Ski Area. And then the next peak there is the Valles Caldera on the North Rim. Uh, then we then a, a large descent down to, uh, down to Abiquiu. And then we get to Canhulon Mountain. You can see Abiquiu is at 6,000 and Canhulon's at uh, 10, 9. So and there's, there's some more ups and downs in there. So that's a really, that's a, that's a big day there. Um, passing through Saboya, good re resupply there. Um, you get to Cap Cooper's El Vado Ranch, um, where I, I was able to camp there. His, there's a campground and, and cabins, really nice place to stay. Uh, after that, we passed through Gaina. And then uh, this peak over here is when we get to the San Pedro Wilderness Boundary at about 9,400 uh, feet. This, this part is just super beautiful. We're going to see a lot of pictures here tonight about when I, when I rode this uh, route. Um, and I, I just love this, this area, the Himas. Um, this is La Cueva, so Amanda's Country Store, the Himas Pueblo, and then we have the La, P La Palitza Canyon, the namesake of the route. And you can look at this climb here and you can see that it is not too many miles, but it is very steep. And so it's, it's, it, it, it deserves its name of uh, the beating. Uh, <laughs> So when, after, uh, after ascending La Palitza Canyon, you get to the Valles Caldera, the south rim at 9,400 feet. Um, you drop down in the caldera and you pass, uh, you exit out, out of the east rim um, of the Valles Caldera there at 9,600 feet. And then you end up back at Los Alamos at the end there. So I did it in six days. And uh, so I did five nights of camping. Uh, one, two, three, four, and five stars on the map there show where I camped. Uh, first star there is the upper right uh, picture, and that is just outside of Abiquiu. Uh, camp there the first night. The lower left is at Cooper's Elvado Ranch, just right on the, uh, the uh, river there. Really nice uh, campground. And uh, the shot on, on the lower right there is just after leaving Gaina. That's the uh, yeah, star number four there, and, I, and I'm only a couple miles out of town there, and there's really great camping uh, there. What we're going to do here is just kind of go through the map. We're going to highlight a section. We're going to say where we went, and we're going to look at some basic stats, uh, how many miles, what the elevation gain was. We'll look at a quick elevation profile, but the main thing here is to look at the pictures. Um, I did this in uh, the fall of last year, around October. And it was just the colors were just turning and it was beautiful and I took a ton of pictures and we're going to share those with you tonight. So on day one, here I am. This is a, this is a Pajarito ski area. You can see all the colors are starting to change there. And this is, this is leaving uh, the ski area there bound for, uh, for um, a Kenyatta Bonita Trail. And, and yes, I did get a ride to, uh, 
Suharito. I didn't I didn't write up the hill, so full disclosure. <laughs> Uh, after after you uh, getting to Kenyatta Benita single track, you uh, you get back into the woods, and this is the east entrance to the Valles Caldera, where you do a nice descent down into the caldera, where you get really expansive views, and uh, you can see the rim of the caldera in the in the distance there. It's the north rim. Uh, you pass uh, by San Antonio Creek. Uh, you can fill up water here if you need to. Um, and then on the north rim, um, it is a rim of a caldera, and, and so you have to get out of the caldera. And so the the first you know climb challenge is getting out of the the north rim of the caldera, and uh, but the views are just spectacular looking out over. Um, so this is on the north um, rim, looking south, uh, climbing a little bit higher there, a little glam shot of the bike. And you can see the uh, the caldera in the background. Just just definitely worth the first climb. Um, so after you exit the park, you follow some Forest Service roads for a little bit, and this is where you drop into the secret entrance of Chiha Buenos uh, Canyon. I want to thank uh, Nathan uh, Burnside for telling me about this. He he developed a route that the, the same path that we're going here from from Los Alamos to Abiquiu. And he told me about this portion and I, and I couldn't leave it out of a, of a bigger loop here. So I wanna thank him for, uh, for giving me the bait on this. This is a really fun, this is a really fun portion of single track that drops into uh, the, um, this nice uh, pasture and meadow. Uh, this has got all, before you come down, there's some cliffs there that are just awesome. Um, you can see the fall colors here, just in full, full effect. Um, then we eventually get down into uh, the valley here, and uh, you can see the single track going through the valley. It's 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 a small track. Sometimes it kind of peters in and out, and you're most you're kind of following cattle tracks, and, and kind of it it'll, it'll gets a little spaghetti here and there. But as long as you stay in in the, the bottom of the valley here, you can't you can't go wrong. This is a really cool section um, of the route. And just uh, here's the, the creek that flows down the canyon. There are a bunch of cattle. And so you do have to treat your water um, like most places. Um, but the water here I, I found to be pretty good and, and the river was, was flowing pretty clear. Um, towards the bottom of the valley, you leave, uh, you leave the, the valley and you get back out onto forest roads. Um, here's just a really cool uh, section of geology, um, some sediment, sedimentary deposits that Look nice. Um, so once you once you leave Chihuahuanos Valley, you climb up out of the valley and you head down to uh, Abiquiu, and that's where you get your first resupply. Now Bode's General Store is just is a great. You know you don't really need to carry much food or resupply starting in Los Alamos because you will hit Bode's um, on day one if you if you make it there or day two. But uh, Bode's is a great uh, grocery store. There's uh, tons of snacks and candy and bars, but they have, a, they have a, a, a cafe there with burgers and sandwiches and fries. So you can imagine on this first day, uh, I think it was 53 miles or something. I was, I was pretty happy to grab a burger and some, uh, some potato salad there, but you can really, they have baked goods, uh, breads and desserts and, and even fresh vegetables, meat and cheese if you're into uh, you know, cooking elaborate meals when you're, when you're out there. Um, after after Bodes, you continued on the highway um, for just a short stretch on pavement. That's this is one of the twenty percent of uh, pavement on the route. But you, you, after about four or five miles, you get off of, of off of pavement and you start heading up into the national forest. So this is where I camped for the first night. Um, just you know, super beautiful looking out there. Um, nice sunset. Um, so that was day one. Um, so I, I did 53 miles and about 4,200 feet elevation gain. Uh, you can see in the profile here that it, you know, you, you lose a lot of elevation. So my elevation loss was about 6,500 feet. So more, more loss and gain. So despite it being 53 miles, um, you know, I was able to get this done in the first day. Um, so the second day, uh, we did 30, I did 35 miles, but uh, 5,300 feet of elevation gain. And, this is this is the big climb that I was mentioning, you know, starting down by Abiquiu and ending up in uh, Kenhilan Peak. There, it's it's a it's a massive climb and it's only 35 miles, but I was shattered by the time I got to the campground and it took me all day. 
Um, but I still have a smile on my face. So, so that was good. So this is waking up in the morning uh, at that campsite and kind of pulling away from the campsite. You can see the, see the moon um, in the upper right there. And uh, that's Abiquiu Lake in the distance. Uh, as you continue going up, you can see Ghost Ranch in the uh, distance there with uh, just really you know, beautiful uh, outcrops. And here's another shot of uh, so if you do you do climb a ways a before you get into the the national forest it's a little barren but you do eventually get up into the trees um, and you continue heading up this is a one of the, the lesser forest roads that connects one section to another um, you can, it's pretty steep here I mean that looks too steep but this is definitely one part where I had to push my bike for a little bit. Um, you know, that being said, the, the route is, is I would say it's, you know, 99% rideable. It's, it, there's no big hike a bike fest here, but here's one little section that'll, that'll test you if you're, if you're a little tired. But they, you can see the fall colors here, just super beautiful. Um, you get a little bit higher, you start getting up into the Aspens. And then uh, you get to a water supply, <laughs> not the tank, but uh, the water that's flowing into the tank. This is a Rancheria Spring, and uh, you know I can see on the left here, um, right about my mile sixty is where I camped, and this is about my this is about by mile eighty where Rancheria Spring is, and in those twenty miles I had I had drank most of my water, and I was actually concerned that if I didn't find the spring or hit the spring that it would be a very long ride before I could get to uh, Count Hill and Campground. Um, which I, it says no water. There is no provided water, but there is a, there's a creek there that you can get water. But anyways, this Rancheria Spring, it is a, it's a very relied upon source. Um, the CDT passes right through here, which is the uh, Continental Divide Trail, uh, and the National Scenic Trail that goes from Canada to Mexico, um, and is a very rugged trail. And, these, and often these hikers are going from one water supply to a very long distance to another water supply. So they, they have detailed information on where they can find um, water on these big hikes. Rancheria Spring here is, is one of those dependable, very clean springs. It's not, again, you're not dipping your bottle into the bucket here, but you're getting it out of the pipe. And it's cold, it's, it's great water, um, and I didn't even and filter it. It was just, it's, it's great spring water. Um, so this is a key on this big climb here, hitting this spring. It, and if, if you see it right on the road, it's not it's not hard to find, but you'll be very happy when you when you get there. Um, so you follow the CDT for a little bit. There's another section of single track. Uh, we're getting we're getting pretty high up now. We're getting near uh, Ken Hill on campground. Um, hey, and there we are. So there's a couple lakes there. It was far too cold when I was there, but I could imagine if you did this in the summer or late spring, uh, you definitely want to jump in that water. Uh, it, was, it was pretty cold in, in October though. So I just got some water and filtered. Well, there's, this, there's actually a creek that flows in here and that's, that's where I, I got my water there. Um, it, it, it flows really nice. That's another spot that the CDT hikers, you know, identify in their maps as a good source. So um, here's just, a, yeah, I guess, zoomed in portion showing the Count Hill on campground. You can camp there, there's no water. Um, there's the creek, but man, if you go just beyond there, now you, you, you have to follow the CDT for about three or five miles, but after you climb for a little while, there's this meadow there, and I didn't take a picture, unfortunately, but there's fantastic camping um, if you just go a couple miles past the campground. Um, so that was day two. Um, I did end up camping uh, in that meadow past the campground, um, and it was, it, was, it was quite nice. And uh, so the next day, uh, on the map you can see highlighted in green is where I went on, on day three here. This is a bit more of a chill day. Uh, day one was a big, you know, in terms of miles, big day in terms of miles, and then day two is a monster of a climb. And so, uh, you know, in this day I took it a little bit easy, 42 miles, you know, 1700 feet elevation gain. And you can see in the beginning, um, you know, it takes a little bit of a hike to get to the top of uh, Can Hill on Mountain here. But once you do, this is a massive descent. Most of the day, you're riding on fast, uh, you're riding on fast roads and with a, with a grade going in the right direction. And you know this section here can be quite fast. Um, and that's good. And it's good that this is a, this is a fast section because on the map you can see 
I've written uh, private land, no camping. So anywhere that's white here is all private land. We'll see some fences in a second. This is all ranching land. So this is one of the longest sections that you do have to ride without having an ability to wild camp. Uh, Savoya is about 107 or 108. And Cooper's, you don't get there till about mile 135. Uh, so you're looking at, you know, maybe 20, 25 miles. They're fast miles, but, uh, you know, this is one section where you, uh, you got to get through it. No camping. <laughs> Um, so in the morning, I woke up and, and rode to the top of Can Juan Peak here. Um, unfortunately, this is when all those fires, uh, unfortunately, were happening in California and Oregon, Washington, seemingly everywhere. Um, I know it, even in Los Alamos, you know, we were getting some pretty bad uh, air quality warnings. Um, so probably wasn't the best time to be going out and doing all of this hard exercise. Um, but, uh, oh well, I had fun. But you can see in this picture that the view is a little obscured by the by the smoke. They're not too bad. I mean, it, it, the smoke wasn't too terrible. Um, but you, you know, these these views here would be a little bit better uh, without the smoke. But still, it was it was it was awesome. Um, you know, here's looking looking south from the top. Um, I didn't know this, but at the top of Canhuan Peak is one of the oldest fire watches that uh, it's not really used anymore, but the building's still there and, and in a pinch, I, I guess you could, uh, you could stay here. But uh, I believe the reason that nobody stays or this isn't a fire watch anymore is, is this building got struck by lightning too many times and people stopped uh, wanting to be up there. So I, I can understand that. So if you do stay here, uh, full, full caution, <laughs> known for lightning strikes, but cool little building. Um, so coming down, this is what I mean, coming down off the backside of Canyon Island Peak. I mean, it's rideable. I mean, you get pretty rowdy coming off this thing. Uh, I, I ended up you know, walking part of it because I, I was by myself. I did not want to fall and get hurt. Uh, but it's pretty rowdy descent. It's, it, you know, it's pretty fun. Uh, you can see it coming down here. And yeah, you're not, the sign says no wheeled. Uh, motorized cross-country travel, so I assume bikes are not motorized, so, well, at least mine wasn't. Uh, so I figured I'd be okay, but you can obviously see the tire tracks of naughty people, who, you know, off-road up there. But it's pretty, it's a pretty wicked descent, and uh, it, it, it's pretty fun coming out of there. Um, so, you know, it's, it's pretty steep for a little bit, but it, it flattens out once you get to some more maintained uh, forest service roads, but you're still just kind of gliding on these nice roads downhill. Um, this was just gorgeous. You're dropping into the forest here with the fall colors. Um, you know, you can't help but just smile going, you know, with the wind going through your hair. It was just a beautiful descent going out of, um, you know, coming off of Ken Hill Mountain. Uh, once you do, you get to uh, Saboya, which you have another uh, resupply point. Um, not during COVID times, but there is a full bar inside, uh, so you can saddle up and grab a beer and whatever. Uh, they don't really make food, but they do have frozen burritos and pizza. And I didn't know that uh, well, when, the, when the bar is going on, apparently you can get a beer and they'll cook you up a frozen pizza. And so I was in a little bit of hurry this day. I wasn't, I didn't know that they had that all available. But if I do this again, I'm definitely going to stop and, and have them make me up a frozen pizza because that'd be pretty sweet. Um, but they, they have ice cream and water, drinks, soda, um, snacks. It's it's a it's a it's not a grocery store, but you know, I did see a, a jar of peanut butter and some tortillas in there. So, you know, if you're if you're willing to make it work, there's definitely plenty of uh, food in there to uh to make meals. Um, so after you leave Savoia, this is where you get into the, uh, the private land on either side. But this is a county road, it's County Road 303. And you will see some no trespassing signs, not on the road, but they, they make it so it looks like you might be going on private land. So I called up the county and I said, County Road 303, can I, as a private, as a, is this a public road to drive from Savoia to, um, to Elvado Reservoir? And they said, yeah, not a problem. So I verified with the county. It looks good. Uh, but it, this is all this is all private land. So you, you got to stay in the road. Um, but it's, it's, it's awesome out here. It's desolate. 
but it's really uh, it's really fast riding. Again, you're just going downhill. Um, I didn't have any headwind here, so I, I can imagine though if you had a headwind, this this could be a little a little vicious. Uh, but it was nice and cool with no wind for me, uh, so it's it really fast riding. But this is a, a little canyon break, um, seemingly in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it was just you know the green just kind of pops out in this really stark landscape. Uh, so this is fun. I, I stopped there and, and had a little bit of lunch. Uh, you do have to cross uh, Nutrias Creek here, which means Otter Creek. Uh, I don't see any otters though. It's this is a heavily uh, there's a lot of cattle out here, and you can see there's, there has been some some degradation of the of the watershed. You do have to cross this uh, this creek here. I, it, for me, it was in October, the water was really low. And so I was able to just kind of hop with my bike over these river stones and, and able to get across this without dipping a toe in the water. Um, but it, you know, if, if you know, this is one, one area where you have to be cautioned, you know, it could flash flood. Um, if it just rained that day, the water could be a little bit higher here. So this could be a, uh, a little bit of a barrier you have to consider. But you know, most people are driving across this, uh, you know, most of the year, and so I, you know, I think I don't, I don't think crossing this is much of an issue uh, most of the time. But something to consider. Uh, once you drop, once you cross Nutrius Creek, there you you keep on going here um, on this on the County Road 303, and eventually you get out of there and back to the pavement. Uh, this is a little section of pavement that takes you to Cooper's El Vado Ranch. Uh, I'd never been to this place before, but it's pretty neat. There's log cabins and camping. Uh, you can park an RV. Um, there's great fishing right on the water, and you can uh, you can also camp there. Uh, they have a little store of not a whole lot of food. I mean, I was there in October, and they they you know they were slowing down for the season, so they didn't really have a whole lot um, of uh, supplies. But they had you know snacks and candy. Uh, some tuna, spam, canned foods, and they had a little little freezer there with frozen burritos and little microwave uh, Jimmy Dean sandwiches. And uh, I got down on those. I was pretty hungry when I got in there, and I ate a couple of frozen burritos. <laughs> so they got it again. You know, if you're willing to like make it work, they have you know plenty of food there uh, to resupply. Uh, so this is the campground. You can see the uh, Tama River in the background. You can, you can camp right, right on the river. Um, it's pretty nice. And you could go up the creek uh, a little bit. There was these really cool cliffs. Uh, this is as, as the sun setting there. There wasn't a lot of people there, but this is great uh, fishing. Um, there's a lot of, there were, of the people that were there, mostly people were, were, uh, were fishing. So I, I don't think it's a good area for that. Um, so yeah, that was day three, uh, you know, started at, near Ken Hillon Campground or Ken Hillon Mountain and, you know, crossed that big stretch to get to Cooper's El Bottle Ranch. Um, and uh, that's where I camped that night and uh, the next morning got up to do day four. So day four was, uh, you know, I started at Cooper's and, and made all the way to uh, Guyana and camped just a little bit past uh, Guyana. There, that took me um, that was about 44 miles and 3,600 feet, and uh, this wasn't a, this wasn't a too bad bad of a day um, either. It's kind of a I'd consider an average day um, in terms of you know how hard it was, um, but you know um, yeah. So it was day four, and I was starting to you know feel like I was in the groove and you know really enjoy myself on this route. Uh, so you know after waking up. Uh, you do a little bit of climbing, you get on top of the uh, uh, El Vado Dam Reservoir, um, Reservoir Dam, and here's a shot of it. Um, this is really cool in the morning there. It was just completely still and just silent. Um, it's kind of nice to have a big place like this seemingly to yourself. Uh, so after you cross um, the dam there, you you keep going and, and uh, and you, you, you're passing through kind of all a sagebrush area and it's it's not too remote, but you know, you feel like you're kind of out in the middle of, of nowhere. You you are passing through uh, next to the Hickory Apache Indian Reservation. So this is another area on the map where, you, you know, there's a small section where you're not allowed to camp. Um, and I've identified those. So, you know, I, I really hope if people do follow this route that they respect 
private landowners and Native American land um, and do not you know, camp on those. Um, but anyway, so you, you can see here, we're passing uh, by the, by, um, uh, through the Hickory land and eventually we get back into the national forest here and you can, you can see we're going south. This, this kind of looks like an eerie foggy day, but again, that's all, that's all smoke. <laughs> so, um, but it did make for a pretty dramatic photo here. I like this one a lot. Um, and we're heading south now you know, in the direction towards, towards Guyana. Uh, so heading further south, we're getting into more of the forested areas. Uh, we do pass a little uh, creek here, and for the life of me, I cannot remember the name of this creek. I do, I, I indicate on the map that it is a source of water, but you can see here that, you know, it's flowing pretty, you know, low. It looks a little saline. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't depend on this as a, as a I wouldn't rely on this as a, as a fill up, but, you know, you could drink this water if you, if you really needed to. Um, you know, in, in the past few days that I've been, I've been describing, uh, you know, stopping at Bodes was a big water supply that was easy, and Saboya at the Acordo Cantina, that was great, and at, at Cooper's, uh, you know, those are great at places where you don't have to filter and you can, and you can stock up. So if you, you know, it depends on, you have to ask that, you have to, have to ask yourself that question, how much water do you want to carry? If you carry a bigger capacity, you can make it for a longer period, but you know, if you're going to put a bunch of water on your bike, you do have to pedal that bike. <laughs> so you have to find what works for you. Um, and you know, it is it is it is New Mexico here, so there's you know there's, there's not a ton of water, but there I do indicate on the map where you know the reliable um, water supply can be found. So once you once you hit the um, once you hit the river that I cannot name. <laughs> You, uh, you, you cross it and you start ascending the backside of a French Mesa. And this is this was a little hidden gem. It is steep here, but it's completely rideable. And I remember looking at, uh, at Google Earth and Ride with GPS and all these planning programs trying to you know, figure out if it was possible to get up the backside of French Mesa. And I was looking at the elevation profile. I was like, wow, this is gonna be a little bit of a climb. Um, and you know, if this is a really bad road, this could be a potentially hike a bike section, but you know, this was a challenging climb, but it was surprisingly rideable. And uh, it, you know, once you start climbing up the, the colors and the rock um, just start, you know, popping out at you. And uh, here we are on top of French Mesa and just the awesome geology in the background with the blue, or at the, uh, there are some like blues and reds and yellows in there. It's just, it's just amazing, and once you get on top of uh, of the mesa here, it just keeps on going uh, for a long way. So you're you're following these outcrops, and they're super colorful, and you get this really you know rich red dirt you're riding over, and and it's it's not you know, once you get on top of the mesa, the riding is pretty gentle, and it's just big big views and and big fun. This is like the burger tour, but <laughs> I don't know how, you know, some people can operate pretty good on bars and gels and stuff. I'm one of those people that I, I kind of need to eat. I need to supplement with like, re, you know, quote unquote, real food every now and then making like sandwiches and getting a burger and fries. And I just can't survive on, you know, dehydrated meals and, and, uh, and bars and stuff all the time. So here we go, is another shot of a uh, nice burger fry. This is Papa Joe's Diner in uh, Guyana, New Mexico. Uh, they're closed on Mondays. You know, some of these places I do mention, um, you know, they, they do have limited hours. Most of them are open every day, but like Papa Joe's Diner, uh, they are closed on Mondays. So if you're depending on it as, as, as a source for food or resupply water, you know, make sure you understand and call ahead. Um, you know, I did with all these small businesses. Um, you know, just to verify, even, you know, even if uh, Google Maps says something, you know, not, uh, not every, you know, that, that doesn't get updated as frequently as needed sometimes. And some of these small businesses in remote areas, they may have updated it a year ago and, and they just, you know, during COVID, who knows? I, I strongly recommend contacting these businesses if you're going to depend on them for resupply. Um, but, you know, they have great food here. They got, uh, they got home cooked food. Uh, burgers, Frito pie, sandwiches, pretty New Mexican, burritos, tacos, enchilada. They were super happy to refill my water. Um, they have coffee, dessert, ice cream. I left this place just like waddling away. It was so full. Um, 
and just interestingly enough, they they they're they're very cyclist friendly here. They the Great Divide mountain biking route, uh, I believe, two years ago got re gets got rerouted when we had all those um, national forest closures, and so they uh, they rerouted the route to go through Guyana, I believe. And this is where I might get it wrong, but I believe the Trans Am. There's another uh, long route that goes from the East Coast to the West Coast. And it, might, it might be the Trans Am. I, I could be wrong. But it also passes by on this road. And so, you know, when I walked up to the counter, he was like, hey, you go north or south, east or west. And he was, you know, used to chatting with cyclists, super friendly um, and happy to give you some, you know, water and some food to go. Uh, really nice people there. So after uh, after getting a burger in my belly, we this uh, you ride through the small community of Guyana. You can you know, still see the awesome colors of the exposed geology in the background there, and uh, it doesn't take much until you get back into the national forest. A couple of miles um, through town, and you jump off on a, on a forest service road, and it's super flat for like miles and miles. There's it just you can camp anywhere you want. It's really nice camping here. So that's where I bedded down for on day four. Um, so we'll look at day five now. So from there, I you know headed south to uh, the San Pedro Wilderness, uh, skirting that on the east side, and we're gonna go south to join up with the San Antonio Creek. There's some hot springs. Uh, further south, you have the option of going to La Cueva, um, or you can there you can continue on 376 there and not go down to Amanda's Country Store. But by this time, I was I was ready for a soda and, and needed some some food. And 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 the Amanda's Country Store, you know, is a you know it's a pretty good grocery store. There's meats and and. Uh, cheeses and vegetables and breads and you know you can you can definitely you know resupply there with you know if you want to make fast meals or make more involved meals i think i grabbed a bunch of hot dog buns and some sausages and just got down that night i was i was pretty happy about that <laughs> let's look at the pictures anyway um, so boom, fall colors again. The uh, aspens are just screaming at you i i must have taken like i don't know 300 pictures of of the fall colors. Every time I turned around, I was like, ooh, that's a nice picture. Like, ooh, that's a nice picture. So, uh, you know, it just seemed a little crazy, you know, after a while. It's like, how many pictures of the aspens do I need? But it was just too beautiful not to take um, lots of pictures. And so uh, after, after riding for about, I think, 10, 15 miles, you do pass by the Rizumadero campground. And again, this is really nice. It actually pit toilets here. There's no water. Um, but right down the street, um, not far, like maybe a half mile, no guarantees on that, maybe, maybe a mile. There is a really nice spring, I'll show you a picture of that. But uh, th you know, if, you, if you got to Guyana and you really wanted to push it for another you know, 10, 15 miles, this, this would make a great um, place to camp. And there is uh, water down the street, not too far. So on the map there highlighted uh, in the, on the left, there is a, a circle there and that shows um, the spring, I don't know if it has a name, but it's just past the Rizumadero campground, probably not more than a mile. Um, again, this is one of those, those springs you come across and it's just flowing super nice and cold and it's clean. And, um, you know, I, I drank this without, I felt pretty comfortable drinking this without uh, filtering it. And well, I'm okay now. So, so hopefully it was fine. But man, yeah, this is one of those just like, wow, yeah, this is great water. Um, look at that, more fall colors just around every bend. It was just so gorgeous. So you can see the, the, the road here, the surface though. I mean, it, but, you know, most of the riding on this route is, is not technically challenging. It's more of an you know, endurance. Um, you know, it's following roads that look similar to this. Um, here's, you know, it gets a little bit, a little bit muddier, a little bit, you know, less graded, but still, still, still a nice, nice road to uh, to ride and kind of relax and go through the mountains. Um, you do uh, going through this section here. Um, eventually, you do reach a uh, a major road, and this is a road that will lead you down to San near San Antonio Creek in the in the hot springs. Um, you go through a little gate here, and you. Um, you start heading down, and that's the uh, San Antonio Valley, San Antonio Creek at the bottom there. Uh, 
colors just screaming out there again. Nice little fun descent. This is probably looking more familiar for people. Uh, that's San Antonio Creek. And you can see there's single track on the right side of the creek there. And you go down that for quite a ways um, until you get to the hot springs. I wouldn't recommend camping right here at the hot springs, but anywhere up, upstream of the, of the hot springs, uh, there's tons of places to, uh, to camp. So in uh, the water here, again, there's lots of cattle. There's water, this creek flows out of the caldera. There's cattle in the caldera. You should treat your water. Um, but this, this I've, I've gotten water from this creek many times and treated it, and it, 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 uh, it flows pretty clear, and, and it's, a, it's a decent uh, resupply point to fill up on water. Um, so there's me crossing the bridge, going to the, uh, the hot springs there. I think I was there on like a Wednesday morning or afternoon. I was like, oh, there's not going to be a lot of people. There's a ton of people there. So forewarned, the, the hot springs are really nice. Um, but be prepared for other people to be there. Um, so heading away from the hot springs, um, it's nice to show. I think that's a Redondo Peak, actually. And uh, so after after here, I went to uh, down to Amanda's um, country store in La Cueva and resupplied, and then you jump on Forest Road 376. And 376 is, is a nicely graded um, road here. It's very popular for camping. Uh, it's really fast riding. There's some, uh, but the geology is again, it's it's pretty cool. It's it's mostly tough, um, just outcropped here. But they kind of form these hoodoos and form these uh, you know other weathered patterns here. And it's it's just a neat uh, forest service road. Uh, there's tons of camping down here. Uh, once you get down to this point, you hit the uh, the Jemez a watershed, and you can. There's several rivers that join to flow down this watershed, um, and so at this point, there's a lot of camping next to the river, and you can resupply your water no problem. This is uh, you see my bike here. It's got a trailer on the back here. This is not this trip, but I uh, I didn't take a picture of this campsite when I did this trip. And now I've now camped at this site, I think three times. I, I love this site. The views are nice. Uh, just down the hill on the back side there, there's great water um, and there's a campfire ring. It's super flat. So I like to camp here. Um, so that was day five. Um, that was a pretty, that was a pretty good day at 51 miles, 4,200 feet, um, including stopping at the hot springs, stopping to resupply. Uh, you know, that was definitely a, a sun up to sundown. Uh, type of day. And that brings us to the last day. Um, this was a pretty long last day, 57 miles and 6,200 feet, uh, the max grade 15 percent. I mean, this is this is a long day, but you, you know that you can, there's a couple places that you can camp if you don't want to do this in one, you know, huge day. But, you know, by day six, I knew that I could order a pizza when I get home, I got home and get a beer. And so, you know, I definitely had that motivation. You can see on the, uh, on the elevation profile here, you can see this massive climb and that is La, that's uh, Palitza Canyon, the namesake of the route, Palitza Grande. And on this last day, you, you ascend it, you can see the top two peaks here. Those are the, uh, those are the crests of the caldera. And then you reach back um, to the Los Alamos at the end here. So let's see. Okay, so I camped on right. I camped on uh, 376, and you start. Yeah, I started heading south on 376 uh, pretty early in the morning. I knew I had a long day ahead of me, um, so I started early. It's really fast in the beginning um, here to get down to the uh, Jimenez Pueblo. But it's again, it's just gorgeous. I and mean, look at this, the fall cover, colors, the road's nice, it's super fun. Um, the river keeps on continuing down there. Um, it does get a little, you get a little bit further. So, you know, when you're closer upstream to the river, I, I, I recommend getting water there, but we will pass through um, a, uh, the Himalayas Pueblo and there's a convenience store there. So water is nearby. It's coming up soon, but. First, we get to the, the Gilman Tunnels, and I had never been to the Gilman Tunnels. This is one of the part of the route, one section of the route that I, I hadn't ridden before, and I actually had never been here. Um, 
you know, as Rod said, I, I only moved to Los Alamos four years ago. And so there's only so much, I mean, I've done tons of exploring in the Jemez, but I never made it to the Gilman tunnels. And I was blown away. I was like, wow, this is super cool. Um, you know, just uh, it's fun to ride your bike through. There's there's actually rock climbing here too. So really neat spot. Um, really just cool geology. So after you pass through the Gilman tunnels, you you start heading uh, further south and you know getting towards the uh, Jemez Pueblo. Um, continuing down, getting closer. Okay, here we are uh, entering the Jemez Reservation. And we get to the Walatawa convenience store. And this is another great spot to resupply. Uh, there's bre they have breakfast burritos and uh, corn dogs and, and uh, chicken strips. I mean, this isn't health food, but you don't care. <laughs> You're day six. You, I was killing a corn dog and, and chicken strips. I got a breakfast burrito in my back pocket. <laughs> um, but you know, they got typical gas station uh, foods. Uh, they 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 had a little bit um, you know more than a regular gas station. Uh, they did have some like meat and cheese and some a little bit of veggies. Uh, they had a lot of you know put you know pre-packed sandwiches and chips and cookies and you know gas station food. But if you're an expired if you're an experienced uh, bike packer, you know you know how to make good meals out of gas station food. I, this is pretty good resupply here, and I you know I grabbed all the calories I thought I'd need for the day, topped up on all my water and uh, you know, headed out. So this is leaving, uh, this is after leaving the convenience store and heading south, um, you eventually then turn up, to, uh, well, up Palitza Canyon, I forget the road that you do, but you turn towards Ponderosa, a little community of Ponderosa. Here's a shot of a, a vineyard if you're def if you're if you're planning on camping between here and Los Alamos, maybe you could grab some wine. Uh, but if you're planning on making the long <laughs> the long climb back to Los Alamos, uh, maybe not. But uh, I, in the future, I would like to stop by and, and uh, talk to these guys and grab some wine and see what it's all about. Uh, if you do see some water flowing, uh, it is de it's, it's it's irrigation water um, for cattle. Uh, and crops and stuff, and it comes from this kind of reservoir. So it may look like it's flowing water, but uh, you know, a little caution, definitely treat on the water um, if you do need it, but you should have followed, if you, you should be well topped up from the uh, convenience store. Uh, pretty soon you get back into the, the national forest here and uh, you can see us you know, passing the boundary there and then getting uh, into the Palitza Canyon. So here's, you know, it's a steep climb. It is, uh, you do a lot of elevation and also the quality of the road, um, you know, it's, it's a little loose. Going up this, you get a little frustrated uh, with the traction, losing it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's Palitza Canyon. It's, it's, it's the beating. It's, you know, this is what it's all about. But it's, it's beautiful back in here. It's remote. Um, and, uh, well, a little suffering is good for you. Uh, so here we are. Continuing up, you can see the road. It's you know definitely a little bit uh, eroded and not as good as some of the other roads we've seen here, uh, but it keeps on going up. And another, you know, if you, if you really need water, you can. Uh, but you know, I, I suggest carrying about four liters of water. That was good enough for me, and I didn't have to supplement with any of these. Um, I call them less desirable sources. Um, but here we are, getting close to the top of Palitza Canyon. Once you do get to the top, you are treated to a view of the caldera. So you, um, you know, those people that recognize the, uh, the caldera here, you can kind of see it in the distance. You do uh, descend down into um, the caldera and you, you cross it again. So at, we are at the south uh, rim of the caldera. You go down into the park, you cross it, and we are gonna exit the eastern um, portion of the park here to get out of the, the caldera once again. That, that's, um, you know, we crossed the caldera here, we're back into the forest, and then there's a pretty steep climb to get, you know, back out of the, uh, the caldera, but eventually you get back to the gate here and uh, crossing the Cañada Bonita Trail, 
um, you get back to Pajarito ski area. And then it's a really quick and fun, uh, you know, kind of a last hoorah <laughs> descent from Pajarito uh, down into Los Alamos. It is, you know, in the beginning I said, if you can get a ride up to the ski area, don't, don't do the climb if you don't need to, but on the way down, it's no problem. And after six days of, of doing this route, I was, you know, I was just, you know, having a good time flying down the hill there. Um, so yeah, that was day six there. That brought me back to uh, Los Alamos. It was a long day, 6,200 feet, 50, you know, about 58 miles. Um, but I was, I was happy to kind of push it that last day and get back so that I could, you know, sleep in a nice bed, get a cold beer. I definitely ordered a pizza. <laughs> So it was good. Um, so yeah, so that's the route. That was that was me doing it. Um, you know, last fall did it in about six days. Uh, and um, you know, I'm just gonna break here to see if we have any questions about the route. Um, what we're gonna talk about next is is the planning in this route and like kind of where to put the gear on the bike and and all that kind of stuff um, if we have time. But right now, I was just gonna break and see if anybody had questions specifically. Um, from the route. Yeah. Thanks, Dylan. Great so far. Awesome, awesome route. Um, and photos, those photos are amazing. Um, we do have a couple questions that came in specifically about the route. A lot of questions about uh, your gear and planning mm. and, and um, logistics. So, uh, so I'll hold on to those and see if you answer those in this next section. Okay. Um, but first, uh, did you have to ask for permission to, to cross any any lands and specifically the Pueblos? Great question. Um, no, all the roads um, that I that I followed here are all public roads. They, you know, they're they're access to the public, um, not requiring any permission. There were there was one section, where was it? It was it was approaching French Mesa. It is a public road, but somebody has like this really cool property back there. And they do have signs up that say you can cross if you're like a hunter and everything's okay, but you have to go through a couple of fences. And I, you know, I, I, I felt a little bit weird getting up to that point and I just didn't want to put that in the, in the route here. So, so no, that you don't, there's no permissions or, or any uh, thing that needs to be obtained beforehand. Um, you just need to note that where and when you're allowed to, um, you're, you're allowed to camp. So you know, the, the tan areas, Native American land, the white areas are private land. Um, and then the Valles Caldera, um, it, you know, it's each of these land, um, the boundaries, there, there's a sign. It's really clear when you're, when you're passing from one um, to the other. And, and you'll see on this, uh, on County Road 303, you'll see, you know, no trespassing signs a lot, you know, so definitely stay on the road. Great, thank you. All right, next one. Did you have any wildlife encounters along the way? Um, not on this trip, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, this is a pretty benign trip. I have been on other trips where we've seen uh, uh, grizzly bears. I, my, <laughs> another not bike packing trip, I have been attacked by an elk in my tent. Uh, but no, this one was, this one was, was pretty good. Oh, that is not, that's not true. I had a raccoon one night. Oh man, <laughs> I almost forgot about that. I woke up in the middle of the night and I had a raccoon on my bike trying to get into my food. And so um, I had, uh, I had it's just like a, a candy bar or something. So I had to get my food and put it up in the tree. And, uh, and so nothing too scary, but raccoons, man, they are pesky and they will find you. They'll find your food. <laughs> oh geez, thankfully not anything more serious. No. Nah. Except the elk on the tent, that would be... Be yeah, we'll save that story yeah. for another time. Right. <laughs> All right. How much of the route was pavement, pavement versus dirt? Yeah, it's about eighty percent, um, or no, seventy percent dirt. Well, I guess it'd be eighty percent dirt. It's eighty percent dirt, twenty percent pavement, um, but then five percent of that is is single tracks. I guess that's dirt. So it's eighty twenty um, with a little, you know, I think fifteen miles of single track thrown in there just to kind of test your metal. All right, and a couple of people are asking about your map. Um, we're gonna we're gonna share that the link to the route later, right? 
Yeah, we will. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, this map will be available to download. This might, I'm not sure if this is in your gear, but did you did you quantify your calorie intake with the, all the gas station stops? <laughs> no, you don't even, I, you're just, honestly, I, it's, it's hard to even eat as much as you need to. Uh, at some point, you're just like eating becomes kind of a chore. Um, you know, ideally on the, on, when you're spending 12 hours, you know, a day on a bike, you're burning, you know, who knows how many calories. I've never calculated, I've never, done like racing or, you know, trained intensively, but, you know, four to 5,000 calories is, you know, is definitely we kind of need to keep, keep going. So you're, you know, say, you know, sometimes you're just eating a Snickers bar and, and whatever else you got, just because, you know, you need to kind of eat that in advance before, before you need it. Um, because you definitely want, you definitely don't want to get hungry and then be trying to compensate for a lack of calories. Um, you know, after you needed them, that, it's not good. <laughs> All right, just one more, and then we'll let you sure. get on to it. Um, uh, we saw how many how many miles per day, but uh, timing. How many hours per day were you riding? <sighs> um, yeah, sun up to sundown on some of those big days. Uh, you know, the, even the, the thirty five mile day. You know, leaving. You know, I was just outside of Abiquiu and climbing up to Can Hill on a mountain. That was only like 35 miles, but, you know, I woke up at, at, at sun up and I was pitching my tent as the sun was going down and making food. So, you know, it's, it's really hard. It's, I don't know, you can, I usually estimate that I about, I travel about five miles an hour, which sounds like really slow, but, you know, when you got a bloated bike, and, you know, and that's kind of averaged over the day. You stop to, uh, you know, to eat and stop to go to the bathroom or just take a rest, get some water, fill up, you know. But I'd say, you know, I'd say a good guess is, you know, take that daily mileage and divide by about four to five miles an hour. And, you know, that'll, that'll get you, that'll give you an idea of approximately how, how many hours I was cycling each day. Great. Thank you. All right. I think I'll, I'll save the rest and see if, uh we answer those on the next one okay cool so yeah after the going through the route there um you know i know people would you know not too familiar with with bike packing so i'm just going to kind of go over some of the the gear that i used um and where i put it on the bike and uh yeah just kind of go through some of the the nerdy gear details i mean i can go way more into detail on the nerdy gear gear details but uh We'll, we'll, we'll save that a little bit, but we'll just go over the, you know, some of the basics. So what was my bike? Um, this is a bike that I built up a couple of years ago. It's a Carver 420 titanium frame. Um, my previous bike packing bike, well, that, I have a bunch of pictures later. We'll see like different incarnations of, of bike packing rigs that I've had. Um, but, you know, this was kind of, my, I built this bike to be kind of a long-term um, hardtail, uh, you know, reliable bike. So it's a, it's a titanium frame. Before I had a Surly ECR, and that thing was a tank. It was really reliable, but wow, switching to a titanium frame, I mean, I think I lost a, easily a pound just in frame weight. Um, so that was really nice. Uh, a fork, I got a 140 uh, RockShox Pike on the front, uh, super reliable uh, fork there. 140, 140 millimeters might be a little bit much. Um, you know, I, you know, and I, I, I usually pump up the, the PSI, so I'm definitely riding a little higher in the travel and not using all of it. But I, I definitely wanted a pike though, uh, because it's definitely it's a, it's a sturdy fork. You can bike pack on, a, on like a Fox 34, um, but you know the pike is just a little bit, you know, a little bit bigger, a little bit beefier. And if you're going to be loading up your bike, um, it's a nice fork to have. Uh, so in terms of gearing, uh, if you'll notice the detail here, there's no derailleur. Uh, this is a, I have a roll-off 14 speed um, internal gear hub in the back, and that's laced to a Next-T uh, carbon rim. And so the internal gear hub, the roll-off is, it adds, you know, different people have different estimates of how it compares to like a, a regular derailleur setup. But it's about a it's about a pound penalty over that. It's heavy, um, and when I had it out this on my ECR with twenty nine and 
um, you know, rims on there with three inch tires. Man, that was a beast of a bike. Um, oh yeah, I guess I didn't say that. This bike can be 27 uh, plus or 29. Uh, here I have it in 27 plus mode. Um, so I have 27 plus rims and the tires. Oh good, I believe in the front I have a 2.8 and I believe in the back I have a 2.6. Yeah, that would make sense. Um, in the front, it's just kind of a generic wheel. It's a DT Swiss 350 uh, lace to a arc, a race face arc um, or rim, Not, nothing special. Um, but that, that roll off and the saddle here, the Brooks B17, uh, those both have uh, like 5,000 miles of bike packing. Uh, so the, the, the internal gear, I've, I've never had a, a single issue with that. Um, it is heavy, a little bit of a penalty, but man, it's just, its simplicity is awesome. And that Brooks B17, that takes, they say, well, it took me at least 500 miles and sometimes it takes longer to break it in. But, you know, what? once you work your butt imprint into that thing, it is a really comfortable saddle, uh, but it's leather and uh, it's, it's fierce at first. So, you know, there's some, um, you can, there's some oils that you can add to it, but it really, you just got to put the miles on um, into the saddle. But once you do that, it's, it's really nice and comfortable. And I can be on that all day and, and not, you know, have any, not develop any issues. We're not going to go into what potential issues might be, but it's a very comfortable saddle. We'll just put it that way. Um, so where did all my stuff go? Uh, they, there's a frame bag. Um, I actually sewed that myself, but uh, you can get frame bags from uh, other manufacturers. Uh, you can get custom ones. Uh, I made this one because I, um, well, I was bored. It was COVID. I needed a, I, excuse me. I needed a, I needed a project. So I made some uh, bike packing gear. So that was fun. Um, what do I keep in there? I have a MSR pocket rocket. Love that. Love that stove. It's, you know, it's not the smallest stove. It's not the lightest stove, but that stove is, is super reliable. I've used it in really cold temperatures. I've used it in high winds. It is just a, it's a really good um, a stove. They have, the, they have the Pocket Rocket 2 now, which I think shaved a little bit of weight, but I, and I, I think it'd be an equally good stove if you're, if you're looking at getting a uh, stove. Uh, but for the most part, I keep the frame bag free of, of gear because it's just a really easy place to stuff food. Um, you know, so I'll have dinners and some meals in there, some instant coffee, breakfast foods. Um, you know, I'll leave some extra room in there. I need to chuck a sandwich if I, you know, to go if I'm at a convenience store. Um, that's that's kind of a, it's nice to have, because if your volume's changing a lot um, with your food, you know, you may resupply and you have a lot of food and then, you know, towards the end, you don't have a lot of food. Um, having, putting that in your frame bag, um, you know, frame bag isn't going to change size, whereas the other bags that you see on here, those are going to change size based on what you have in them. And so uh, having food in the frame bag is just, it's just easy um, that I've, I've found. I've also packed my bike like 5,000 different ways. So this is what I did. For ways. We'll show some pictures in a little bit of my different setups, but you know, the, the only the only best, the, the only um, advice I can give you is you got to get out and, and do some overnighters if you're going to try this. And you'll figure out really quickly where you want to put gear and where, where you know, uh, gear feels good and feels stable. But anyways, so that's my frame bag. Um, in the front there, I have like a harness. It's not what's shown in here. I have a, a Rockgeist bar jam, but it, it, it operates really similar to this where you grab a a dry bag. Um, in this instance, I have the Sea to Summit Big River uh, dry bags, and that's a that's a beefy bag. Like that that thing's designed for um, whitewater rafting and canoeing, and kayaking, and you know rocks and stuff. But you know, on a, on a bike, uh, abrasion is your worst enemy. So having you know a really good dry sack um, is is important. It's it's worth the weight. Um, you know, to carry it a little bit, you know, carry a little bit uh, better bag. But what do I keep in this? It's right out front. I mean, if it rains, it's just going to get poured on. Um, but that's where I keep my sleeping bag and a down jacket. Um, and uh, so my sleeping bag, I have a Marmot Pinnacle. It's a down bag. I think it's like 800 fill. Um, it's 15 degree bag. It's great. I've, I've used this thing on, for years. It's, it's great. And then uh, 
I have this down jacket I got, um, actually I got in, in China. I, I, know, I had a layover for a day and I went to Decathlon and they had a, a down jacket there. Decathlon is like a, a supermarket kind of for outdoor gear in, in Europe, but it, they also had one in China. And, uh, but they, they make really good um, line gears. I, I have like a, I think it's a 700 fill down jacket from them. Just kind of, you know, not too, uh, not too big of a name brand, but it only weighs nine ounces and packs down to nothing. So, but anyways, uh, you know, out front, I have this dry bag. It's, it's rated for, for rafting, you know, but it keeps my down. And, you know, if anybody has experience with bike packing or backpacking or mountaineering, you know, if you're bringing down, you got to be really make sure that it stays dry. Um, so hanging off the back, I have my seat bag. Uh, you can see my cooking pot just like kind of dangling off the side there. It actually straps down so it's not, you know, it doesn't sound like a cowbell or anything going down the road. Um, but it's just, it's just one of those objects that's really easy to strap to the outside. Um, whereas if you tried to put it in uh, inside somewhere, it'd just take up a really big volume. But, you know, you can do all sorts of weird things. You can pack food in there if you want to kind of take up that volume and put it in your frame bag, you know, experiment and try what works for you. Uh, this is what works for me. Uh, so in the seat bag, I have the cook pot hanging off. Um, inside, I have a Big Agnes Copper Spur uh, High Volume Ultra Light One. Uh, I love Big Agnes tents. Uh, I have a Copper Spur Ultra Light Two that I've been using for years. Um, and that's a little bit, you know, more roomy. It's a two person tent, feels a little plush, a little luxurious. But if you're going to be going for uh, longer than a week bike packing, you know, having a two person tent is, is really nice. Uh, some of the longer uh, trails that I've, that I've done, like the Great Divide, which is like 2,700 miles, or the Baja Divide, I don't remember, like a thousand miles or something. You know, you're on, if you're doing weeks and weeks, it's really nice to have a two person tent. But I, I have a one person here for, you know, solo missions and, you know, shorter trips. Um, they are pretty pricey, these big Agnes tents. Um, however, I scored this one at an REI used gear sale for a hundred bucks and it's like a $400 tent. So, you know, I, if you can get your hands on a big Agnes tent, I highly recommend it. They're super durable. Um, they, there's a really, a really good compromise between durability and weight. Um, so I also have a tent footprint in there to protect my tent from ground. And I have a sleeping pad, a super plush X-Ped Sinmat 3D7 size medium. Um, like I, I feel almost embarrassed for carrying this thing because it weighs like two and a half pounds. But man, at the end of the day, you blow this thing up and you disappear into the night. You know, it's like if you have a really good, a really good night's sleep, you're gonna recharge and have that energy for the next day. Um, but this this sleeping pad is is definitely really heavy. I, I I took it because in uh, when I was in like October and it was it was cold at night you know my water was freezing um, a little bit every night and so I, on previous trips I've just you know froze my butt off and, and this trip I knew it was going to be a bit cold so I just I took the I took the comfort and then my next item here a pillow <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have made this list I'm kind of embarrassed now show all my luxury items here. But hey, if you have a good night's sleep, uh, it, nothing beats a good night's sleep. So I have a, a Sea of Summit Eros, size large, cause you know, just why not? Um, pillow, it only weighs a couple ounces, but you know, all those ounces do, do add up, but you have to make that decision, you know, what you, what's your level of comfort, you know, versus how much weight you wanna to carry. So I carry some of these heavier things, but you know, I, I you know, for clothing here, I bring an extra pair of socks. I bring a merino wool base layer, top and bottom, that I can sleep in. A really lightweight pair of swim shorts, and uh, I didn't actually. This I do. I do bring a second pair of uh, of shorts, uh, chamois riding, you know, cycling shorts. I'm not using the same ones the entire trip. <laughs> Some people might have that question. I brought, brought a second one, but I, you know, so I sacrifice a little bit in. Uh, in having you know a bunch of extra spare clothes, um, not carrying all that weight, but I'd rather have a really nice sleeping pad and pillow and a 15 degree bag so that I'm not cold at night. I, I uh, avoiding the cold is you know being cold while while you're camping and you're trying to do big miles is is just never fun.
Um, oh yeah, and at the bottom here, I don't really have any good pictures, so I tried to blow it up, but underneath my down tube is where I keep a lot of my water. I have a two liter uh, clean canteen in stainless steel that you, rocks can have thrown up at this thing and it just, it never leaks. Uh, it's a great place uh, to place water. Um, I also had a small um, uh, like a hydration vest that I wore that I don't have pictured here. And I think that that was another, that was two liters in there. So this two liters plus the two liters on my back gave me four liters. Uh, but you know, if, if under if underneath your down tube, if you're able to fit a big bottle like this and it's, you have to look at tire clearance um, and you know, the crank clearance, um, and it's kind of depends on what frame you have, but if you can put a bunch of weight down there, it makes the bike really stable versus putting the, uh, the water, you know, higher up. Another good place to put water is on the front fork legs. I didn't choose to, to do any, but you can put some bottle cages on your fork legs there to carry extra bottles if you want to add capacity. Um, the only problem with the bottle being down here is it will inevitably become covered in cow poop. And that is disgusting, but <laughs> you have to, you have to decide what, you know, I, I really like having my, you know, this amount of weight down there and my clean canteen, it stays nice and sealed. Um, and I'm able to clean it off and get water out there without contaminating it, but just forewarned, if you're gonna put a bottle down there, you're gonna be riding on forest service roads, going through puddles and that bottle will get covered in unmentionables. Um, so just, you know, it's a good place to put water, but you have to, ask yourself if it's, if it's worth it. <laughs> um, so the, in front here we have, uh, so we kind of went over the, you know, the big items here, the frame bag, the front roll and the seat pack. Um, and then we're gonna zoom in a little bit on the cockpit here to look at some of the smaller uh, packages. I don't really have a good photo here. This is the best photo I could kind of get from the uh, top. And then I have a little side view over here, but I have these things called feed bags that go on either side of the uh, stem. This is a gas tank. And then I have the GPS. I think I have all this you know, labeled here, so we can go through it. Um, in the front here, I have a, a GPS, a Garmin eTrex 30. This is actually my first time using uh, this device. Before I had navigated solely on uh, using my cell phone, um, but I also usually traveled with other people. I recommend definitely having a backup GPS. So if if you're gonna be traveling by yourself, in this instance, I carried a, uh, a cell phone, so that has GPS uh, capabilities. And then I had this independent uh, GPS, the Garmin eTrex 30, that they make a bunch of different kinds. But you know, if I'm traveling by myself, uh, it was nice to have a, a backup GPS in there. Um, so sitting behind there, as I mentioned, are the feed bags. Uh, and these are great. These are just great for, for stuffing, um, some food in there and snacks. Um, usually, you know, one of them I reserve for food and snacks. The left one here, um, you can see it barely, but I have a uh, bear spray in there. I do carry bear spray. It might be for bears, maybe other animals, uh, you know, also weird humans, you know. <laughs> I know somebody, people always ask you, like, do you carry a gun? And it's like, no, but I have bear spray. And now, you know, that. I don't, I don't want to use it. It's probably not, I don't know. I, I always carry bear spray, especially when I'm by myself for you know, personal security, but you know, there are bears and you, and you never know. Um, we've all heard the stories about mountain bikers and bears coming around a corner and spooking one. So, you know, carrying bear spray, it's, it, it's something that I, I do no problem. Um, and then also you can't really see it, but I carry a Garmin InReach Mini. Yet another little device here. The Garmin InReach Mini though is a, is a nice little uh, device. I don't think I have a picture here, but it's a it's a satellite communicator, and it's very small. Uh, it's not cheap, but uh, you can carry it with you, and it'll it'll send um, it'll send GPS points at whatever frequency you want. But people can monitor your progress with this, so it'll upload where you're at. Yeah, I think anywhere like down to two minute interval. But I, I on these trips, I, I set it to like maybe an hour. But that way, uh, friends and family can watch me. And uh, if for some reason anything were bad to happen to me, they would at least know where I last was and could, could come get me. Um, you, 
the inReach device also has the ability um, to, you can contact emergency services through it. It pairs to your cell phone. Um, so you send texts through there, though you can sell, send rudimentary texts through the device itself. Uh, it's a pricey little, a little guy, but you know, if you're gonna go on a big adventure um, like this and, and be in some remote areas, uh, it's just really comforting to have you know, these kind of backup systems. I mean, it gives me a lot of confidence to just really kind of charge and push myself and not think that if I really you know, need help or get in trouble, I, you know, I, I have that, that option to, to, to get help. Um, fortunately, I didn't need any help this trip, so that's nice. Um, so behind the, the feed bags um, is uh, what I have is called gas tank. Revely Designs make it. Um, Revely Designs is, you know, they make a bunch of different uh, bike packing gear. Um, they also make the feed bags, but you know, there's a lot of different companies that make these little small compartments. Inside of, inside of the gas tank, I have a little tiny um, dry bag in there. That's not the big water. I mean, it's waterproof, but it's not the big uh, a dry river bag, but uh, inside there I have my battery bank and charging cables and things that I, I you know, any electronics that I don't want to, to get, uh, to get, you know, wet and compromised. Um, so now I'm going to show you where I started off. After going through my, you know, this setup, it's like, oh yeah, it's a pretty dialed kit, and I, I feel pretty good about this um, kit. This is my first, uh, this is my first bike here, but you can see that Brooks saddle. I, that's the OG. It's been there from day one. Um, so that, that's probably the long. That's probably the longest uh, piece of gear that I've had, or the piece of gear I've had for the longest amount of time. But you can see that you know when you first start out, you're trying to figure out where stuff goes. My setup looks a little sloppy here, um, but you know I crossed the state of Oregon in a couple couple days, five or six days, and that was my first trip, and it was it was, it was super fun. Um, after that, I, I did uh, the Great Divide mountain biking route and holy smokes, look at all that water. And I brought a guitar. Uh, it was, this bike weighed a ton, but you know, it was okay. And uh, me and my buddy, Nick uh, here, we, we, route, we, we rode the whole uh, route, the Great Divide mountain biking route. And here, here's our, us at Antelope Wells. This is at the, uh, the border with Mexico. It's, we're pretty happy to be, to be finished. Um, but you know, this is the classic photo everybody takes at the end of the route. Um, then we went down to Baja and we did the Baja divide um, with Nick again. Uh, we spent a lot of a lot of miles together and here we are on the uh, Baja divide on the beach there and, and it's like coming from uh, the great divide here with all this stuff you can see how much more slim down on my bike is. I still have a lot of water on there because there was some serious sections of, of Baja that you know you needed a lot of water but it was so warm that I, I you know other than uh, having a, I don't even think I had a spare pair of clothes really towards the end. We're, we're pretty, we're riding pretty light. <laughs> um, so that was good. Oh, and then this was a, this is, uh, this is my ACR again. We're just showing like a really, really light setup here. Uh, this is when uh, buddy uh, Michael and I, we, we tried to ride the Chama Charmer and uh, we encountered a bunch of mud and eventually had to bail. But here's that, uh, here's my roll off uh, hub here. You can see that, you know, despite just going through peanut butter mud here, I, I could, you know, easily keep on pedaling. Um, it's just here where, you know, in the chain stays where you get mud build up. But the roll off is just indestructible. Um, it's it's expensive. It's heavy. But you know, if you want to, if you want like a zombie apocalypse setup, the roll off is is, is pretty good. And, and people have put tens of thousands of miles, if not more, on them. Um, Here's a, here's a full suspension, you know, you can, you know, ride what you got, you know, if you're in, if you want to get into bike packing, um, you know, make, make your current setup uh, work. You, you don't have to buy a whole new bike. Uh, you might have to buy, you know, some bags and stuff to get your, get your gear on there. But here's a, a trip I took on, uh, I believe this is the Chama Charmer, but here's an Ibis Mojo 3 that I outfitted uh, for, for bike packing. It's, it's fun. Uh, it's, it's fun bike packing with a full suspension bike. You can definitely get Pretty rowdy on the on the, on the uh, descent. And so here's sweet little Lola. Uh, this is our, our dog Lola, and we got her about two years ago. She hates her trailer. Uh, we spent so much money on this trailer, and then I made this little insert, uh, and she would just much rather run herself into the dirt 
uh, next to the bike. So I'm still trying to get into dog packing, but uh, at this point, you know, they've only been short trips where she largely just uh, ride or just runs next to me. Other people have had success uh, dog packing, as they call it, with these type of trailers, but uh, we'll see. We'll see how this one works out. Um, uh, there's just the mojo again. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty slim uh, setup here. You can see I, I did have a bottle that could fit underneath here, but you know, I think this is just a, a quick overnighter. Not too big of a trip. Slimming down here's you know I got the Carver 420. This this is not the roll off in the back. This was single speed, so that was that was a fun little venture. But this is just to kind of show you that you know different bikes, different setups. Um, you know use the bike you've got, and uh, here and then yeah here's my setup for my last my last trip. So um, you know like you know how do you plan for for a bike packing trip? I kind of went over the gear, but it's you know it's very similar to a backpacking trip. Um, generally, backpacking, you're, you're you're kind of going into the wilderness, and you're not unless you're doing a through hike. You're you're kind of taking everything with you, and then and then you come back out. With bikepacking, you, you get to resupply points a little more frequently. It depends on how you design your route. But as you saw in this route, um, you know we we pass through a lot of towns and a lot of resupply points. So you you don't really need to carry you know too much food. Um, but if you're if you're first if you're if you're starting out bikepacking. You know, I, I recommend, you know, just like backpacking, follow a pre-planned route. Um, look at some popular areas, uh, you know, download a GPS track and make sure you can navigate it. Um, here's some links that I've given here. Uh, ridewithgps.com uh, is a great uh, resource for, for making routes and exploring areas. They have a bunch of different background uh, base layers um, with like the USGS and Esri. Um, it has a lot of resources to plan a route um, yourself. Bikepacking.com is a great resource where there are popular and established routes, and they they'll, they'll give you similar maps to like this and indicate you know where where there's resupply and where, where you can camp. Uh, and then Trailforks.com is also a resource if you you know this is if you kind of want to add some single track in there or um, you know, there are some longer routes that have been uploaded to uh, trail forks, like uh, like the overnighter uh, that I mentioned right in the beginning, the Chihuahuanos uh, Creek. Uh, you know, there's a trail forks um, a GPS that goes from Pajarito Ski Area to Abiquiu, and that's a great overnighter, um, or even just like a one day trip. Uh, so, you know, when, you, when you're following this GPS tracker, I recommend carrying a backup GPS. And that doesn't mean you have to carry, if you're going out with two or three other people, um, and everybody has, you know, phones that they know how to navigate with, great, you have three GPS devices, you're fine. Um, you know, I, when you go by yourself, I, I, you know, I had a Garmin e-trex and a cell phone, and that made me feel good that I had two methods of, uh, uh, you know, two GPS devices that I could follow. Um, when you set out for this, you know, try not to, you know, be over, try not to tackle too much. You know, if you've been riding bikes, you know, considering, even if you're if you're a fit rider, you know, considering what it's going to be like to you know maybe you have like a 28 pound bike or 30 pound bike, you know, but when you load it up, it's you're going to add a lot of weight, and so you you're going to have to really scale back what you think you can uh, you can do. I recommend uh, loading up your bike and just going for several test rides. You'll figure out how how and when stuff will fall off your bike and how to make things more secure. Um, you know, so definitely determine a level of fitness and like realistic mileage of what you can do on a loaded bike, where you think you're gonna resupply, um, how much water and food breaks you may need. So, you know, I don't know, maybe 30 to 40 miles for an average rider that wants to start out. Um, you know, the big thing is, to, is, is, you know, especially in New Mexico is to plan your water capacity, you know, estimate your rate of use and identify places to refill along the route. Um, you know, having enough food is one thing, uh, but you know, as you saw in these pictures, in pre remote areas, not a lot of water supply. So you know, understanding how much your water you're going to drink, and that's based on you. It's kind of like how much food you need to eat. Uh, you need to you know, determine what what's a realistic amount that you'll need uh, to do that. And that's you know, honestly, the more you do it, the more you learn. Um, so you know that's this is my last slide here. Um, I have submitted the route to bikepacking.com for review. 
right now, the link right here is, uh, is with ridewithgps.com routes. And you can, you know, type in 343-96342. And that'll, you know, this link will get you to the GPS track. Um, you can also search by uh, the title of the route on, on ridewithgps.com and just type in La Felice Grande. And you can also uh, get to the route, I, I, you know, it's public. And so you can download the GPS there. Also um, associated with the route is this map. Um, you know, it's not, it's not too detailed, but it, I, I found it really helpful to just get a kind of scope about the, uh, about the, the route. When you're camping somewhere, I indicate the mileage on there so you can kind of, you know, if you're just kind of going day by day, you can kind of plan your next, um, your, you know, next route. And then, you know, the, here's an elevation profile. On the ride with GPS, it, it provides the, the elevation profile so you can identify, you know, big climbs and kind of plan out your days. Um, and you know your expectations on where you would resupply and where you're going to camp that night. Um, but yeah, so I, you know, I'm as far as I know, I'm the only person who's written this route because I, I haven't really put it out there. I've, I've uh, shared the the link on some bike packing forums, largely on Facebook. Um, I have submitted to bikepacking.com, but you know their website you know definitely focuses a little bit more on established routes. So what I would do like to do at this point is kind of get you know riders to ride the route, provide some feedback. And if it is and if it is a cool route, then I think it'll naturally uh, become popular. And then you know hopefully I can you can find a, a you know more permanent home than just a uh, ride with GPS on here. So hopefully we can get it, hopefully I can get it on a uh, on a, on a, on a format or a form like a, a bikepacking.com. Yeah. If anybody wants to ride the route, you know, download the GPX. I'm I'd be more than happy to answer any logistics questions, uh, bike-related questions. You know, if you're going to set out, you know, you know, let me know, and uh, I can give you any data or any information that I have. But it'd be really cool to get some people to ride this route, and uh, I'm planning on riding it uh, again this year with some friends. Uh, we're going to see with the weather, uh, you know, how the weather holds up, and I've already seen some other other interest of people riding this so yeah hit me up um and uh you know let me know if, if, if people have any questions and uh i'd be you know more than happy to to help people plan plan a trip like this or you know even a smaller trip uh, as rod mentioned you know a few of the top riders i have organized a few bike packing trips um this last year with covid I, you know, just didn't feel comfortable, you know, getting groups of people together. I mean, nobody did. And so I'm hoping this next year that we can, uh, you know, leaving from Los Alamos, have some overnighters and get more people involved in bike packing. Um, and yeah, who knows, maybe some people will ride this route. But yeah, that's all I have for now, Beth. Uh, if there's other questions that people have, I'm happy to answer them. That's great. Thank you so much, Dylan. Yeah, I, I apologize. I haven't been responding to people. I've been trying to catch or keep up with the, the questions coming in in the chat. So uh, I can dive into those. Um, I do want to be respectful of anybody of people's time. If anybody has to go, uh, but you all you have questions lingering, um, shoot me an email, respond to any of those emails that came from Peak, and we can uh, we can get you in touch with Dylan or, or, um, or get those answered for you if anybody has to go. But uh, as long as you're okay sticking, sticking with us, Dylan, I can answer or ask, start asking, going through these questions. Sure, sounds good. Okay, so the first one, um, someone was curious that you didn't use panniers, um, the uh, side saddlebags for weight distribution, or was that just a personal preference? Yeah, the, I mean, when you're, Panniers worked, and, and um, actually for the Great Divide route, I did use panniers um, on that picture uh, that I showed earlier. The, you know, it's a preference. Um, I, I prefer the, I mean, I've done it kind of both ways, but I prefer the bike packing bags because um, they're a bit, you know, they're, they're softer and they strap to your bike with Velcro. The, the, there's a lot of load involved with putting a rack on your a rear triangle and then loading up a, a, a paneer and then attaching it to the rack and then, you know, going down roads that are, you know, some of these roads are pretty nasty. And so you have the opportunity there to snap bolts and for fasteners to, to break. Um, 
I find that the soft bags, the, the bike packing bags, they're a little bit more resilient. They definitely take a, they're a little bit harder to pack for sure. Like to get the seat, the, the one that comes off the, the saddle there, the seat bag that you have to pack that really well and you have to attach it to the seat um, good so it doesn't move around. Um, likewise in the front, it's a, it, with the roll on the handlebars, um, I find that's really easy, uh, a good place to put, to put weight. And then when we get to camp, um, you know, the, the front roll comes off pretty quickly. But, you know, people have done it uh, many different ways, and I'm not going to tell you you can't do it with panniers. Um, if, you, if that's the gear you have and that's what you're familiar with, then go for it. Um, you know, just make sure that, you know, uh, be ready for, you know, any gear failures. But that's, that's the case with any, any sort of gear. Um, so, you know, I, I would say that panniers are more focused towards like road touring um, in terms of like what people use, but it's certainly not unheard of for off-road trips. All right, thank you. Uh, I know you mentioned tire size, but uh, someone wanted to know, do you need a tire bigger than 2.2? Oh, no. I mean, you, you, people, you could do this. You could do this route. I mean, what would I recommend on this route? I would, I would say a minimum of 2.2. Um, if, you know, if you, if you want to be comfortable, you know, there, there's, there are people that ride gravel bikes on these roads and people have raced the tour divide on gravel bikes, but you have to like know when you're underbiked a bit and, you know, whether or not you're willing to make that compromise, you know, skinnier tires are great. They weigh less. And when you hit those, you know, nice roads and even pavement, you're, you're able to, you know, get the miles done really quickly. Um, but, you know, something that for me that I realized is like, I, I do appreciate bike packing with like a 2.6 or 2.8 tire because it just makes, makes the ride quality a lot smoother and I feel less fatigued at the end of the day. Um, and I, I even like, you know, I mentioned I have the RockShox Pike on there. Um, you know, on my previous ECR bike, I, that thing was fully rigid. And I, you know, I, I, I like a little, little plush tire and a little plush fork, so. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Uh, what kind of water filter do you choose to use? Oh yeah, um, I use Aquamira Drops. Okay, so it's a, it's a two-part solution, They're really small. It's two bottles and you, you combine seven drops from one and seven drops from the other. And then you wait a couple minutes and it turns into this chlorine solution. You drop that into a liter of water and then you have to wait 20 or 30 minutes it's definitely more of a pain than um, than filtering it in terms of like time, because you know, if you have a filter, you can filter it right then and then drink it. But if you you know if you're gonna do the the chemicals, you have to wait for it to treat. Um, so I've used Aquamira. I find it's just you know if I keep a decent capacity of water and then you know make sure you get topped up at the easy to refill locations, and then you you know you don't have to always fill up and wild you know sources and treat. Uh, I have used uh, the Sawyer Squeeze. I used the Mini when I was on the Great Divide, and it, it clogged up pretty quickly. It wasn't too bad, but I think the full the full uh, Sawyer Squeeze, not the Mini version. I've heard really good results with that, and that's that's pretty small. So I'd consider taking one of those again. Um, but you know, I think Aquamira now they also just make tabs. If you like little pills or something, and, and so that you can just fill up with water, drop a pill in there, put it on your bike, and move on. You know, really, really quickly. I prefer. You know, you have to be a little bit more picky about finding your water sources. Like, you know, if it's a little bit cloudy, it's kind of you know gnarly just to treat with water. That's when like a filter, you know, would be would be necessary. But I, I find the ease and the simplicity of of, of just using chemical uh, tabs or whatever. Uh, I prefer to do that over filtering. All right, next. A uh, couple questions about mechanics. Did you have any uh, mechanical difficulties or repairs on the trip? Uh, and then kind of similar question, what, what repair tools do you bring, spare tubes, anything like that? Yeah, so I run a full I run a full tubeless setup, so there's no tubes in there, and I you know I topped it up with sealant right before I went. So um, tires were fine, and actually in all six days I never added to I never added air to my tires. Um, you know, putting fresh sealant in there, 
uh, right when you leave and putting up to the pressure. Um, it, it coats the, the, the tires really well on the inside. And yeah, five, six days riding, I never, I never added once, uh, you know, air to my tires. So, so that's nice. Um, I do carry a spare too, just in case. I have slashed a sidewall pretty badly before. Um, I do carry some needle and thread if I want to repair a sidewall, but I also carry a tube, um, you know, just worst case scenario there. But I, I um, let's see, what else do I bring? I bring a little extra sealant, about extra two ounces of sealant that, you know, I top up my tires, but I bring a little bit ex extra in case I, you know, get a, a gash in a tire and I need to add extra sealant. Um, I, I, I don't carry any spare spokes, but I carry a thing called a fiber fix. And what it is, is this Kevlar like rope that you can use to replace a bent, a broken spoke um, on the fly on the trail. Now, to be fair, I've actually never used it, but it does come with instructions and I'm hoping that it'll work. I've watched the YouTube videos. Uh, but yeah, that, you know, small little multi-tool, um, some, some levers to get the tire off if I need to, some zip tire, some zip ties. Oh yeah, and then plugs. Um, I, you know, bring uh, these little things called bacon strips, but they, they're, you know, they're little plugs that if you get a big hole in your tire, and it's too big that the sealant can't seal it up. You can put these, you know, kind of like rope with some, I don't know, some molasses on it or something. You can, you, know, you can, they're called plugs, but you can throw those into a bigger uh, hole and that should, and that should plug it up. So I, I bring tons of plugs um, and I've used them successfully on many, many gashes, you know, up to a quarter inch or even more. Um, but on this trip, I didn't have any mechanical failures. I have in the past. Um, mostly just tire related. Um, you know, the roll off hub there is just really bomb proof and you don't have to think about it. You don't have any problems with the derailers and, uh, and yeah, so no, 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 no trouble on this. And I, and I try to keep a minimal kit, but just, you know, just enough to repair most, uh, most problems and enough to get me to a, uh, get me out of there if I need to. All right. What was the weight of your full rig? I have no idea. <laughs> um, my bike, I, if I were to guess on that bike, it'd probably be like 25 or 24 pounds. Um, and then, you know, think about, you know, what you, what, what you carry in a, in a, you know, backpacking, the weight would probably be around 15 pounds with a gear, three to four liters. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it was at least 40, 50 pounds, but I don't have a scale. And honestly, I don't really want to know. <laughs> totally fair enough. Um, uh, do you all, well, I guess you kind of answered this in your uh, photos from other trips, but do you always ride alone? Oh, no. Um, yeah, the past couple of years, I've, I've done some trips with the Tough Riders and, and, um, and I've done some other trips with uh with other people i i don't mind riding alone i don't think i don't think i could do like a really long distance trip without at least one other person so a good friend of mine nick newcomb uh you know him and i we went to college together well grad school and we've worked together and so you know we we rode bikes together a lot and we decided we were going to do the trip together and it was nice having another person there um, you know, doing like a really long trip. And we did a great divide. I think it took us like two months. And so, and it doesn't mean that we like rode together. He's way faster than I am. <laughs> you know, he's beat me to the top of the hill, but you know, so you end up with kind of like riding alone during the day sometimes. Um, but it's nice to like get to a destination, set up camp and, and have somebody, somebody else there. That being said, if you're following some of the bigger trails like the Great Divide and you're a friendly person, and you go during a, a time when other people are out there, you'll inevitably run into other people that are doing the route. And uh, you may end up, you know, finding a friend and, and, and riding for a couple of days or a little bit longer. Um, so yeah, it, it just depends. I don't always ride alone. Um, this was during COVID and I didn't, I didn't feel, um, I didn't want to make a group thing out of it. And, and honestly, I hadn't ridden this route. So I didn't know how much suffering was involved, so I wasn't sure I wanted to sign anybody else up yet. Um, so yeah, it just depends on the route and, and who else I can convince to come with. All right.
right. Uh, type of camera you used? Oh, uh, uh, Samsung 10E. <laughs> Just uh, just a cell phone, but the, man, the, yeah, as you can tell, the, the the cell phones these days, the cameras are getting you know super nice. So this is the couple years old, but I think it's like a Samsung 10E. I believe that's what it's called. Great, thank you. Uh, someone wants to know hydraulic disc or mechanical. Um, yeah, good question. Um, on, I do have hydraulic on on that bike now. Um, but I, on my ECR that I did the Great Divide and the Baja uh, Divide, and uh, I, for those I had mechanical disc brakes, and they're they're totally fine. I had BD7s. They're kind of the nicer um, mechanical disc brake. There are some nicer, um, like, and by nicer I mean like more powerful, because that that's essentially where you're getting at with a mechanical disc brake. You don't have as much stopping power as you do with with hydraulics, but mechanical brakes are definitely a lot easier to maintain in the field compared to hydraulic. Um, look with the dog. So with this bike, you know, with the, this bike, I have the trailer and I was thinking um, eventually with the, if I had the dog on there and I, you know, her, she's riding the trailer and I have all this weight that I'd want to have uh, hydraulic disc brakes on there. So I have hydraulic disc brakes now, um, long answer to a short question, but um, I do I do use hydraulic disc brakes and I've seen many people touring with them. I've never had an issue and it is it, it is a redundant system like you have a front brake and a rear brake. So the chances of like both of them breaking before you can get out of somewhere um, you know are pretty small. And uh, so you know, I, I don't see a problem with uh, with hydraulic disc brakes so long as you know the brake pads are good and you've bled them recently and they're operating fine you know especially for a five to six day trip i, I wouldn't hesitate using them at all all right pros and cons of uh towing your trailer versus versus the bags yeah the tra the trailer is strictly for the dog and the dog hates the trailer so I, you know, when I was first starting, it is, you know, the decision that you can make to whether or not to put panniers on your bike or, or use the soft uh, bike packing bikes um, versus putting it all in a trailer. Like that trailer, you know, when you buy it, it comes with like a huge duffel bag. So you can get everything in there and it's really simple and open and it's probably really easy to pack. Um, that trailer weighs it though, just the trailer weight though is 15 pounds. So, you know, if you think about that in terms of backpacking and how much weight you usually carry, you know, usually your base weight's like 15 pounds or less. And so if you're, you're starting with that, you're already adding 15 pounds and then you're adding, you know, all your gear. So it's, it's definitely heavier and it adds a third wheel and it adds a different wheel size too. So if you're going to carry tubes, you know, you're going to have to carry an extra tube for the rear wheel. Um, I decided this was all worth it for my little dog who hates the trailer. Um, <laughs> but you know, people have traveled all around the world on uh, on the on the trailers or towing trailers, and I, I'm sure it's something you get used to. You know, for with when I go when I've gone dog packing or when I've used the trailer, I haven't really put any weight into it, so I don't really notice the weight um, off the back. The ibex trailers the single wheel if you are going to go with the trailer the, the single wheel uh, it tracks really nicely behind the bike whereas the uh the the, the, um, the trailers with two wheels you know that you see like with kids riding in the back those things you know you're not going to ride that on single track but the ibex uh, single single wheel trailers those things are pretty durable but you, you know there is a weight penalty so again you're gonna have to make that decision for yourself, whether or not you, you think it's worth it. Okay, what kind of saddle? Uh, Brooks B17. It's, uh, they have a lot of different models. Um, that's just the classic B17. You can get them with uh, cutouts. You can get them a little bit narrower. They make them carbon and different variations. But I think the B17 is like the original saddle and it's kind of the long you know tried and true saddle and uh I, I like it a lot all right this might be the last one i'll double check on the chat though um and bear with me uh i don't know my bike terminology but you uh it says you mentioned your bike is 27.5 plus or 29 
Do yeah. you switch switch your roll off hub between wheels or do you have multiple? Yeah. So when I was right, I, I bought the roll off hub when I when I um, when I went off for the Great Divide, and I bought the the Surly ECR. And so I built, I had uh, that the roll off hub built into a twenty nine plus wheel for my ECR, and then um, when I got the Carver four twenty, I had to rebuild it into 27 plus so the, you know, the carver bike the carver 420 is either 27 plus or 29 but I, mean, I think the max is maybe like a 2.4 and a 29 and i like you know if i'm going to be bike if i'm going to be bike packing on a hardtail I, I find like a 2.6 to a 2.8 a little bit more plush tire uh just to be more comfortable um so you know in terms of tire size i, I like that the bike can can swap you know with different sizes but yeah to build the roll off into, you know, a 27.5 versus a 29, you know, I, I, this is only the second time I built it up again, because that's expensive. Um, so for this bike, I, you know, I keep it strictly 27.5. Um, and, and I, I feel that's a good, a happy medium, like a 27.5 plot with a little bit bigger tire on there. I think it's a really comp good compromise between rolling resistance and weight. Um, you know, the ECR with the 29, uh, with the three inch tires, man, that's, it's just, the wheels just are huge. Um, so I find the 27.5 plus uh, format to be pretty good. Okay, I think that is it for questions. Unless anyone else has any last minute, go ahead and throw it in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. I did get a lot of people saying just thank you so much, Dylan. This was uh, extremely comprehe comprehensive for presentation. Uh, just just a great resource and um, a few people saying they're, they'll for sure ride the route. Uh, cool. The women's yeah. bikepacking group in Santa Fe, looking forward to it. Um, some some avid bike bike packers on here, and, and also some beginners. So uh, so cool. just yeah, thank you so much for for sharing tonight. Yeah, no um, problem. Thanks for everybody showing up. I I'm, I'm blown away. I think last time I saw it was like 140 people signed on. So that that's great. You know, and I'd love to see people riding this route. I think it's super fun. It's, it's gorgeous, beautiful. I don't, the logistics are not too hard. You do pass through some small towns and some small businesses. If you're going to rely on those, definitely look, you know, do some research before to make sure that they'll be there for you. But, you know, I, I kind of designed this route to not be too hard, but it, it is called the big beating. So <laughs> it's definitely a good challenge. You know, if you've done some overnighters and you're, you're, you're willing to, you know, you want to step it up the next, the next notch and, you know, go on five or six days and do some big climbs and, you know, that this route is, is perfect for that. This is a great resource and, and so detailed. So thanks again. Yeah, no problem. If, if anybody has any questions, I guess uh, they can email Peak and then, and then they'll uh, put them, put you in contact with me and, uh, and feel free to do that. I'd be more than happy to discuss uh, route logistics or bike details, we can nerd out on gear. Um, I just, you know, I'd like to see this route, you know, become popular and, and people using it as a resource. Cause man, some of these areas, um, you know, I didn't see a lot of other people. There's not bike packing, you know, established routes there. And, and it just kind of goes to some really unique uh, corners in New Mexico that I had never been. And, and uh, so look forward to, to people riding it and providing me some feedback. If, you know, if there's anything wrong with the GPX route or, or there's some extra information you want to include on the map, then let me know. All right. So um, a couple people in the chat are asking for more information about the, let's see, the women's bike packing group in Santa Fe. So Sandra, if you could chat me um, an email address and I will pass that along to Marcy and try to get you two connected. Um, and I'll, I'll stick around if, if you're um, typing into the chat. Okay, just uh, one final little plug. If you'd like to join us again, uh, our usual astronomy talk uh, is this Friday evening and it's about Messier objects. And uh, you can go to the PQ website for more information and to register for that. But um, if, there, if there's anything else, let's see, I'll, I'll stick around. Um, there we go. Thank you so much, Sandra. I'll, uh, I'll get that to Marcy. All right. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for tuning in and have a good night. Thanks, Beth.